Good evening, good morning, good day. Uh, we meet today, uh, it's 8th of March, and we have an amazing guest, Nils Mojneks, who is for almost two years the regional director for Europe at Amnesty International. And you previously were, of course, also a commissioner for human rights at the Council of Europe. And, uh, you know, I do my, I do my uh, honest duty. I check on people before we talk. And when I was uh, Googling your name, it's amazing. It's economy, human rights, social integration, foreign policy, history. The, the, sp the span of subjects is really wide. And how can you, how do you combine all, all of this and, and make time for, for the readings? You know? <laughs> well, I, I, I began my career as a political scientist, um, focusing on the Soviet Union. Um, and I kind of entered human rights almost by mistake. Uh, in 1993, I was here on a postdoctoral fellowship studying ethnic relations. Um, and then I was offered to run the Latvian Center for Human Rights and Ethnic Studies, but also soon thereafter to, to do programming for the Soros Foundation, Human Rights and Ethnic Relations. So I knew a lot about ethnic relations, and then I had to learn about minority rights and about anti-discrimination and about uh, tolerance and all. Uh, related topics and then uh, yeah kind of learned by learned in the field learned by doing I never I don't think I've studied one one day human rights in a university course <laughs> it's, it's evident uh, it, how to say the human rights is in the air yeah so. but then also you know I I wanted to so I did human rights and then I was in government and then I went back into academia and, and then I, I, I taught and wrote about both strands of my background, one on Russian foreign policy and Latvian-Russian relations, and the other on human rights and ethnic relations and tolerance and, and, and so on. Uh, so I've, it, it was, it's difficult to keep up a, a, a specialization in, in two pretty different areas, but I've tried over the years. No, 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 you... Oh. <laughs> okay, sure. I, I wanted to do one follow-up question on Okay, so so Russian Latvian relations, uh, ethnically talking in, in Latvia, all the non-resident uh, passport, uh, the legal arrangement, which has already uh, been up uh, since the 1990s. Uh, so how how is the situation? Is it uh, improving? Are more people naturalizing? And uh, what is how would you say that there is some challenges, legal challenges, that still need to be tackled in that sphere? Well, I, I think if you look at Latvia in a comparative perspective, a good source is uh, the EU Fundamental Rights Agency's uh, surveys on perceptions of discrimination. And Russian speakers in Latvia and the Baltic states don't feel very discriminated against compared to other uh, minorities throughout Europe. Uh, so in that sense, um, the situation has kind of calmed and people have become accustomed to their status and to the language regime and, and, and so on. Uh, that doesn't mean that they feel a sense of belonging or they're happy or they like the government or uh, they have a similar view of history to Latvians. Uh, it just means that um, some of the most burning issues which were very topical in the 1990s have been more or less resolved or at least accepted. Um, and there's always a, a difficult thing to kind of to, to tease out the political aspects and the human rights aspects of some of these things. Um, but I think some of these issues will, will for example, I'll give an issue that right now will become very topical in Latvia, minority education. We have <coughs> Ukrainian refugees streaming in, uh, and in our educational system, basically, unless you go to a very small, there's one Ukrainian school, <laughs> very small one, you have to basically get your education in Latvian. How prepared are Latvian schools to accept uh, Ukrainian teenagers who don't speak a word of Latvian? <laughs> uh, it's going to be a big challenge. Yeah, definitely. Um, what's the the general situation of, of uh, minority language education rights in Europe? This is a... I mean, in some countries, it's a very diverse picture. It's a very mixed bag. and. There's no, the standards, the, the human rights standards are relatively weak. Uh, if you look at 
the Framework Convention on Protection of National Minorities or OSCE standards or uh, the European Charter on, on, on uh, minority and regional languages, those are weak standards. Um, there are so many qualifications and caveats built into those instruments uh, that states can states have a huge margin of, of maneuver. Um, and, in, and this changes over time as well. You had a backlash a few years ago when people thought, oh, we're building parallel societies or divided societies. Uh, so, for example, Sweden, which was very uh, allowed, you know, had, had much provision for minority language education and, uh, for many years, uh, began to tighten it up um, in, in, their, in their integration policy. So this goes also in, in waves. And, um, and the practice in different countries is very diverse. So it's hard to say there's one standard or one best practice in Europe. It, it changes over time. There are very many wide range of human rights, right? And in your work at Amnesty International, what are the main human rights that are most common that you're dealing with in your everyday life, mm. the protection of them? Mm. Well, I, my responsibility is 41 countries. Um, this is all of kind of the EU countries, ex-Yugoslavia and Turkey. Um, you know, in some countries such as Turkey in particular, it's basic freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, um, freedom of association. Um, it, very often in the, in the context of counterterrorism. Um, in Poland and Hungary, it's right to a fair trial, it's access to justice, independence of the judiciary. Um, and these topics are difficult to tackle from an amnesty human rights perspective. Um, amnesty has a very specific approach to human rights issues. It's very different from my previous work at, at the Council of Europe. Um, it's based on individual testimony of victims. In other words, when Poland and Hungary begin to chip away at the independence of the judiciary, amnesty lacks the tools to engage. Uh, for example, amnesty talks about the freedom of expression of judges uh, in Poland, uh, where they are, you know, if you criticize a government or take action, uh, you know, they are targeted by, by the authorities. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's, a different, it's a different approach, it's specifically amnesty approach to human rights. Um, the other kind of, in addition to these three countries and the human rights issues there, the biggest file is migration. Um, and even before Ukraine exploded, um, it, it's been the biggest file for the last five, seven years. Um, and for example, in this year's overview of kind of the region, which I wrote together with a colleague, it's very striking what has happened is that violence and death at Europe's border borders is an acceptable form of deterrence. So you have mass pushbacks. We're not talking about 20, 30 people like we have in Latvia every day uh, with the Belarusian border. We're talking about thousands and thousands of people every day uh, being beaten back with batons, being dragged back into the sea by boat, uh, being turned away at the borders, uh, and very often using a lot of violence and sometimes even torture. Uh, and this takes place all around the EU. So this is, um, so there you have the right to life, you have uh, kind of, uh, the, the, prohibition on uh, torture and ill treatment, um, you have access to asylum, uh, and then afterwards you have conditions of, of reception, and, uh, you know, detention and so on. Um, so those rights are, are systematically and violated in a mass way, and it's considered politically acceptable uh, across Europe, even in Latvia. How, much, how many demonstrations of solidarity did we see for the people coming in through Belarus? Uh, very often from Afghanistan or Iraq, and war zones where our soldiers have fought. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's a second big file. Third big file is women's rights and, and gender equality. Uh, a Amnesty has done a lot of work on uh, reforming rape laws so that they're consent-based, uh, so that women don't have to prove uh, that they resisted or that violence was used uh, or that threats were used, uh, that basically, um, if uh, that basically they don't have to prove that they said no, uh, but the perpetrator would have to prove that the victim said yes. <coughs> and this is a huge line of work. We've done a lot of work on this with some good, good results in Europe. 
Domestic violence as well, everything related to the Istanbul Convention, uh, quite active on that. Um, and the gender aspects of this conflict are going to become very prominent as well. Not, nobody's talking about it yet. But what does it say about gender roles that women are sent away with the children and men are said you have to fight? What does it say, what do trans people, uh, what about them when they reach the border? Are they considered men yeah. who have to fight or are they allowed to be women? What about women who go from Ukraine, which has a very liberal uh, abortion regime, to Poland, where it's literally criminalized? Uh, what can we expect in terms of domestic violence after men return from the front? Uh, what can we expect in terms of the use of sexual violence as an instrument of war? So there are lots of gender aspects to this conflict which are only really going to come out later, but we should be aware and alert to them now. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned uh, freedom of expression of judges. We don't need to look uh, far from here where we see that uh, Sanita Osipova's uh, term was not, uh, she was not elected as, the, uh, as a judge uh, to the Supreme Court, as I, as I correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so does it, does it show that uh, indeed politics cannot exist uh, without the judiciaries or some, some impact on the judiciary? Uh, yes, of course, judges and courts work in a political context. Um, and I think we can be proud that we have, uh, that the Constitutional Court uh, has taken on Latvian politicians and stood up for human rights uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment where it's not easy to do so. Um, so I, I'm really thrilled about the, the constitutional court in Latvia and the way it's evolved over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and same thing with the, with the Supreme Court and the administrative courts. They've become defenders of human rights, very often uh, in opposition to politicians that want to restrict human rights. Um, and then occasionally they get punished for it. Um, and Ms. Osipova, I think, is a case in point. Um, I think that she, this is a different case from, from what you have in Poland or, or, in, or in Hungary where judges are transferred or they are, or they are disciplined and so on. It's just she didn't get the political support to, to assume this, this role for which she was eminently qualified. But how does in the case uh, regarding Ukraine question and, um, you know, we have around 50% of uh, Russian speaking people in Riga and uh, a large part uh, of percentage also in Dalgopils and Latgal region. And we have noticed also in other Baltic states where Russians are quite in a large part. How, how can this question of them being... Uh, classified as Putin supporters or they've been seen as uh, the enemies, how we can how we can ensure that their human rights of just being based on nationality are protected here? Well, I, I don't think this is a, a long-term challenge that Latvia has faced, is that one of the dimensions in which you have a, a, an enduring divide is on geopolitical identities. Um, where I think surveys have shown for the last 25 years or so that Russians are pretty pro-EU in general, but they're very anti-NATO. Um, <clears throat> and they also, um, historically, they have, when relations with Russia are good, they feel much better. When relations with Russia are bad or tense, then it has echoes in domestic uh, ethnic relations. Um, one issue which I think has to be addressed, and still has to, I, I fought this battle and lost it 20 years ago, is uh, public service broadcasting in Russian uh, to strengthen Latvian radio, uh, Latvian television, uh, to strengthen the broadcasting in, in Russian so that, uh, so that it can compete with broadcasts from Russia. Uh, because trying to just ban 
banning RT and Sputnik won't solve the problem that all, uh, you know, most many Russian speakers live in the Russian, in Russia's information space and consume their news and get their view uh, from, you know, from Russia's media outlets. Um, and that's a long-term investment. Uh, you, you will not get this audience quickly. You have to invest a lot of money and time and effort uh, and have a long-term. So I think that's one, one aspect. Um, the other aspect, of course, is how, how, how history and politics and, and social studies are taught in schools. Um, and there's a lot, to, a lot of work to be done there as well. Uh, we've overcome some of the divisions within the educational system basically by, by Latvianizing uh, Russian schools uh, and other minority schools. Um, but that hasn't resolved everything because people also learn their history and politics at home. Yes, of course. And the perspectives are different. Yes, and they're, and they're the, the ability of the state to in, in some way uh, influence kind of discussions uh, or socialization in the home is quite limited, thank God. <laughs> From another perspective, let, it's, it's, it was a really interesting question that got me thinking. Um, in Latvia, uh, there are, of course, parties that uh, may some may associate with certain uh, electorates, and, and we see that the the, for example, the Social Democratic Party Saskanya has, of course, firstly uh, denounced the 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 invasion of Ukraine as well as as uh, Latvian Russian Party the same thing except of only except one deputy so uh, if we see uh, to the north Estonia has the Social Democratic Party uh, had the pr prime ministership uh, recently the Social Democratic Party and we see that uh, they have been of course not denouncing the invasion mm -hmm. so uh, from that perspective we see that the integration uh, and this kind of information space in Latvia may even be more uh, well I would say cohesive and, and secure then, for example, maybe in, in Estonia. How would you see, see this? Well, Estonia's challenge is, is a bit different from Latvia's challenge in, in the minority realm because um, Russians live, uh, are, are more territorially segregated in Estonia than they are in Latvia. Um, Russians are in all the major cities in Latvia. Um, in Estonia, they're primarily in the east and in Tallinn. So that's one challenge. The other challenge is that um, you have a large number of citizens of Russia living in Estonia. Over 100,000 uh, Russians have taken out citizenship of Russia. So they are joined that political community. How can you talk about inte political integration if people have joined? Uh, you know, so this is something I monitored over the years. What was the uptake of citizenship of Russia in Latvia? And it hasn't been very big, which is a good, a good sign, I think. Um, so. Um, in the media realm, to be honest, I haven't seen any convincing research that says, oh, uh, their media space is better than ours or, or, or more integrated or more unified um, or more immune to influences from Russia. I haven't, I haven't seen any data that would convince me of that. Um, it could be that it exists. It's, it's something I haven't followed lately, but uh, I haven't seen anything. One of the also challenging parts of uh, human rights violations is the sex trafficking. And I, w I wanted to ask you what uh, kind of activities uh, you do at Amnesty International to address this issue too? We don't do a whole lot of work on trafficking, uh, which is a very difficult kind of criminal, criminal law adventure where it's very dangerous actually to gather evidence. Um, we just did put out a big report on sex workers in in Ireland, and Amnesty's policy towards sex work is that it should be decriminalized. Uh, basically, it's a it's a harm reduction approach. That the only way to reduce violence, reduce improve the health uh, of sex workers, um, is to legalize it um, and regulate it. Um, and what's interesting in Ireland, the the stereotype was that sex workers are all trafficked. They're all doing this because they're forced to. Um, and my team did a whole bunch of interviews with, uh, with sex workers and, and NGOs working with them and, and lawyers working with them. Um, it turns out uh, that no, uh, at least the ones that we met with, um, you know, that they wanted to do their job safely, uh, securely, and, and be protected from violence and be, feel free to go to the police and so on and so forth. So um, I think we have to be very careful 
when we make assumptions about why people are doing certain things and, and you know, links between sex work and, 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 and trafficking in human beings. Um, I think this is one thing that concerns me a bit about the current flows of people coming across the border, uh, about is there, is there trafficking going on? Who's picking, there's no regulation or, or it's, a, it's a chaotic situation um, in which you have very vulnerable women and children being p picked up by strangers in cars and driven in an unknown directions. Um, and uh, there's a huge risk of, of trafficking um, there, for, not only for sex but for, for other purposes as well. And this is something that has not really received a lot of attention in the media. What can the international community do to solve that? Well, <clears throat> it's hard when you have thousands of people showing up at your border uh, to have the ne uh, necessary kind of safeguards in place. Um, you know, so I ideally if you have children or, or uh, you know, you do, the, you do the necessary checks on people when they come in. You know, are they vulnerable? Do they need, do they need protection? Um, and, and then you make sure that, especially for uh, unaccompanied minors, I didn't see any unaccompanied minors yesterday um, at this center, uh, at Congress NAMS. There's, their minors are apparently being taken to a special facility. And that's what needs to be, not, unaccompanied minors need, need guardians, they need protection, they need to be kept away from, uh, you know, from the risks uh, of being exploited. Since the vast majority of people coming over are women, again, it's a, it's a um, you know, I think we just have to, we have to slowly create an orderly system of processing people who arrive to make sure that those who are vulnerable receive protection, um, uh, you know, that the children are taken care of, the person with disabilities and pregnant women, um, that vulnerability is taken into account when processing these people. Um, and, and that people are given the necessary attention and, and, and care. So it's a, you know, in terms of labor, trafficking for labor purposes, there you really need to strengthen, um, you know, all the labor inspectorates and so on, um, which traditionally in our area of the world have been quite weak. Uh, but that's the only way you can really, really address trafficking in, in you know, for, for work. I mean, I know that uh, you know every country has their different understanding and approach to human rights, and we have seen that also EU countries are not specifically unified. Um, but for example, recently I was in UK, which was also a part of EU at some point, and people seem to be very open uh, about themselves, also trans people and bisexuals, homosexuals. You can see that they are you know, driving in the, in the metro and they hug each other, they kiss, they express themselves. And comparing to other countries, for example, as Poland, as Latvia, I don't see such acceptance of people. There have been cases where these people are abused, also harassed. And of course, I mean, these are not the only countries. I mean, in every country, possibly in UK, it also happens at some point. But it seems that it's more friendly environment for them. And I would like to know maybe your view or maybe the organization's view, how, how it can be dealt in the wrong in the long term to help them get in, be in the, the part of the society that other people also accept them, only not from the human rights perspective as their you know, legal right, but also from just social and humane perspective mm -hmm. that people are more understanding. Yeah, this is, a, again, a long-term challenge. I mean, in, in our area of the world, it has progressed uh, a lot over the last 15, 20 years. Um, but we're still, if I were to name two areas in which Latvia lags, and Latvia is not atypical in Eastern Europe, um, is on migrants and refugee rights and on LGBTI rights. Um, our legislative framework is, has been not very reformed over the last few years. Uh, public opinion is quite conservative and sometimes even hostile. Uh, politicians instrumentalize these topics for, for political gain. Uh, but there is slow progress, as we see in the whole saga about uh, civil unions and same-sex partnerships in Latvia, you know, that the courts are slowly pushing, pushing the, the, the debate forward. Um, you know, it, the, the scary thing as well is, okay, in, in Europe you see the, the general level of protection for LGBTI persons uh, increasing through the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, through, 
through other things. But uh, the problem is that some countries are backsliding very quickly. Russia, over the last 10 years, uh, with all the propaganda of homosexuality and so on, Hungary is backsliding very quickly. Uh, Poland is backsliding very quickly. So you had a slow general progress, and now you're having increasing polarization in some countries uh, going backwards. Um, you know, then uh, the question I like to ask are, are, are we going to be more like Scandinavia or more like Poland in this realm? <laughs> yeah. uh, and I think that the jury is out. Um, the jury is out. I think the population might be moving towards Scandinavia, but the political lead is moving towards Poland. <laughs> <Yeah>. Interesting divide. <laughs> Interesting. Well, at, at some points, this is probably the, in the theory of separation of powers. This might happen, <laughs> but the, the question is really how this will be solved. Can can it be solved within the the, the classical context? But actually, my my main question, what I wanted to ask you, of course, you mentioned Russia. You mentioned Russia and human rights situation has been degrading in the last decades. Uh, and inevitably, uh, also something that has been discussed lately, uh, membership of Russia to the Council of Europe. Mm -hmm. How do you see this issue? Mm -hmm. uh, I saw that uh, at some point you may have commented that uh, the Council of Europe doesn't really bring any real tangible benefit for the Russian people at the moment anyways. Well, right now their voting rights have been suspended, but they haven't, they haven't been kicked out or haven't left yet. Um, I would be surprised if they were to remain in the Council of Europe, um, uh, given, given the war in, in Ukraine and the general political direction. Um, amnesty doesn't have a stand on whether countries should or should not be members of, of organizations. When I was Commissioner for Human Rights, though, what I did say is um, you had a lot of debate about, oh, is it better to have a country in or out? Um, you know, is it, uh, you know, do we want to deprive Russians of the protection of the European Convention on Human Rights? Uh, what, the way I framed it was, do the, do the citizens of the country derive any benefit from their uh, country's membership in the organization? Are the, are the judgments implemented? <laughs> uh, does the government cooperate with the institutions? Uh, Russia didn't cooperate with me after Crimea. They didn't let me into the country. I tried five times. <laughs> um, you know, so if they're not, if they're not cooperating and they're not implementing judgments, uh, then you can say, well, what's a what's the point of membership then? Um, and but amnesty has no stance. <laughs> of course, understandable in that sense. Well, uh, okay, Security Council. How about that? Uh, do you see? Do you see that the situation may be used uh, within the, may be used or solved, I would even say, uh, through the United Nations framework? So, so Russia as a permanent member has having the veto, nothing really <coughs> may happen. International Court of Justice, the, just the jurisdiction will not be, of course, accepted. So how do you see, perhaps, on that, uh, on that uh, level, how can it be solved? Well, I think one thing we've seen in the last 10, 15 years is that the great powers are no longer using the UN as a framework to, uh, for cooperation, for, uh, you know, to resolve um, urgent issues. This was quite clear, um, you know, when the pandemic emerged, and it's been quite clear in a number of different crises. So the UN, the UN's role now is very much in, in question how it will go forward uh, when you have kind of uh, authoritarian great powers uh, blocking important decisions. Um, that said, the other parts of the UN that deal uh, more with human rights have evolved in very creative, interesting ways. Um, for example, the whole system of UN Special Rapporteurs. Um, uh, it's hard to imagine a system that would cost less and have more impact. <laughs> because they don't pay these people anything. They have almost no staff, uh, and they do great work. Um, UPR, uh, Universal Periodic Review, uh, has evolved in a very good direction. It will have very little impact on, on the great powers. But on most other countries, uh, especially those countries in the global south, uh, it has a big impact, um, especially when it's linked to the Sustainable Development Goals and development assistance. Um, and these things are becoming more 
more hooked up. Um, you know, so the UN's in a, in a weird place. On the one hand, the Security Council has an antiquated membership structure, uh, such that it's becoming irrelevant in terms of peace and war, um, uh, and it's blocked. But you have other parts of the UN, kind of the development part, the human rights part, which are finding creative solutions to have some positive impact on the ground. Um, it's frustrating because it won't have a big impact on, on Russia, uh, uh, but it will have a big impact in many other places in the world. In many places in the world, we don't realize this. It's the only game in town. The UN is the only game in town. There's no, you know, there's no EU, there's no NATO, there's no uh, you know, World Bank. It's the UN uh, that is basically the, the biggest player there. And so I think we, it's, it's too early to write off the importance of the UN. <laughs> I just want to touch a little bit back on the Ukraine topic. Maybe you have any information, maybe you have seen or read something more in depth. Um, I've noticed that the, one, the recent information said that around 1.5 million people have left uh, Ukraine um, and went to other EU countries for help, but the overall population is much more than that, uh, and those people most probably have stayed in the country, even though the military you know, activities are taking place there, and probably human rights violations too. But why are they not leaving? What may be the reasons why they don't? I mean, it's the largest part of the society staying there in warfare. Listen, nobody's saying it out loud right now. But the numbers are going to be huge. Uh, people don't want to scare, demoralize uh, the Ukrainians or scare, demoralize receiving countries. Um, but UNHCR and the major um, kind of humanitarian aid organizations, they're not talking about one to two million people leaving. They're talking about 10 to 16 million people leaving. Um, the parallel, the only parallel, uh, it's not even the, the wars in ex-Yugoslavia, it's after World War II. That is a parallel that we should be thinking. We have to think long term. Well, it's going to be a huge, huge challenge. So this is just like the first phase. This is just the very first. This is just the very beginning. Um, there, there'll be many more. People want to leave. They can't leave. That's why all the discussion about humanitarian corridors, um, uh, you know, so the, the flows are going to be significantly bigger. So uh, the organizations in charge are actually preparing themselves for the next waves to come. We have to, we have to think long term. Yeah, of course. At this moment, what comes to my mind is the, the famous or infamous policy of appeasement. How do you see, perhaps given the facts, what we know now, uh, and how we can reflect on how it happened before? Mm. Again, I, I can't speak, I can't speak to, to that. That's a purely kind of political um, issue. What I can point out, though, is that Amnesty, uh, until now, it had a policy that it never commented on wars. It never, it, it tried to keep an impartial position. In a 2005 internal policy document, it said, no, there, there can be exceptions if the entire movement agrees. It's the first time that Amnesty has condemned uh, an armed con the, the aggressor, Russia, in an armed conflict. And it did so after a lot of consultation, did so after, after the invasion began. Um, but Amnesty had never done this before. Um, and of course, it opens up the question, well, why not in Sudan or why not in Yemen? Uh, and of course, these questions will be asked and you will have a lot of debates within the movement. Um, but I think that there was, a, there was a strong sense that you cannot, you cannot hold back this time. You know, it's such a clear cut case. Um, and it's a case that, um, that goes at the core of, of you know, why the human rights system in Europe was created. Uh, it was basically created to stop war, genocide, uh, and dictatorship. And, uh, you know, that's what we're, we're, we're back in a World War II moment. Yeah, indeed. Have, uh, I mean, you know, you have a pretty responsible job, I would say, and you have many different kind of responsibilities and very important decisions to make. How do you relax in your free time from all of that? Well, fortunately, I have a life outside of work. Yeah. Uh, Amazing. <laughs> Probably family, too. <laughs> that's, that's exotic, really. Yeah. 
No, I, I learned a while ago you have to pace yourself in, in human rights and, you know, I want to be doing this for a while, so I have to try to, you know, um, I have a family, I have a, I have a wife and two daughters, um, my parents live with me as well, 93 and 88 years old, so that takes up a lot of my time as well. Um, but I try to keep in shape, I rode my bike here, I, right before the invasion I was very fortunate, I went skiing for a week. <laughs> um, I loved to cross country ski. I, uh, until recently I would go in the mornings uh, uh, around uh, Victory, uh, vic around the Victory Monument and go cross country skiing in the morning. I love to fish, uh, fi and it's even better if you catch something, but if you can spend some time out in nature with some friends, it's great. Uh, we do a lot of boat trips uh, down Latvian rivers. Um, in, in, the, in the summer. So I try to, nature and sports is, is my, and travel, travel not for human rights purposes, but travel <laughs> for relaxation. This is <laughs> you mentioned your parents, uh, a medical doctor and an architectural historian, as I understand. Mm -hmm. How have their professions and their personal interests shaped you throughout your life? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. I haven't thought about it. Because we saw my, when I was growing up, we saw my father work very long hours as a, as a medical doctor, and we all decided we didn't want to be a doctor. <laughs> he worked too hard. Um, but what's interesting, it skipped a generation, and, and my, my daughter is a medical student. My eldest daughter is a medical student, and my, my youngest daughter is studying biomedical engineering. So both completely unrelated to what my, my wife's and my interests and, and, and kind of professional. Runs in the family, yeah. <laughs> like a non-dominant gene. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think my mother's, my mother's interest in European kind of culture and history and architecture um, gave me an appreciation for, for, you know, for these things. When I was, I remember we did my first trip to Europe. I grew up in the United States and uh, I did my first trip to Europe when I was 10 years old, and I remember my mother dragging us to every cathedral in France. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know, and that kind of, so I was, I think it, a friend of mine joked that I had willed myself to be European. Um, and part of it comes from my parents. You know, I have, I have relatives who live in France, um, so I always had that connection. I had relatives here, um, but also, my, my parents oriented my family culturally towards Europe from the very beginning. Um, so it wasn't so much, uh, I, I, I might have willed myself, but the, the path had already been paved by my parents uh, before then. So inevitably, you become a transatlanticist in a sense. Well, I, I laugh now that I'm, I'm no longer a citizen of the United States. I actually, I actually renounced my American citizenship when I became commissioner for human rights. Um, but I have a lot of ties um, to, to, to the U.S. You know, I was, spent the first half of my life there. Uh, I have lots of friends there. My brother and sister still live there. Um, but I prefer to live in Europe. What a story. Yeah. Uh, I maybe, uh, maybe like a, a concluding question would be, so how do you see the next uh, five years so we see maybe the pandemic is uh, slowly uh, kind of pacing down and and all the restrictions perhaps easing of course there are exceptions in in the world uh okay we see that the next conflict uh, as you said will not uh, perhaps be gone that uh, quickly as well uh, do you see any other, perhaps, challenges in the next five, ten years that might uh, be sparked from one way or another? Hmm. Well, I think I think the situation is in such flux right now that it's very difficult to look ahead. You know, for example, energy prices and food prices are going to skyrocket now. How this will impact us, how this will impact the most vulnerable, I think it's very much open to question. Um, the pandemic it's not talked about that much, but the pandemic will have a huge lingering impact. Uh, for example, I think in some countries it's probably set back women's rights for 20, by 20 years. 
uh, the representation of women in leadership positions in, in, in the economy. Um, uh, I think it set it way back. Um, one unfortunate thing about the current situation with the war is Europe has united against Russia. What does that mean? That means that a couple of the bad guys, the Polish and Hungarian governments, are going to get off the hook. Until very recently, they were being heavily pressured by the EU for the first time. Talked about serious conditionality with funding uh, regarding Poland. I think all that discussion will be thrown out the window in the interest of having a unified front against Russia. And who looks like the best guy right now receiving all the refugees? It's Poland. Uh, <clears throat> so I fear that the current geopolitical situation um, will not be good for human rights, um, especially in Poland and Hungary. Um, so there are a number of kind of knock-on effects of the conflict in Ukraine, as well as a pandemic, and we don't really have a full understanding how it's going to play out. But these are some of the things I'm worried about right now. But on the other hand, you know, on the positive side, what is a pandemic? Uh, you know, we've seen some new possibilities emerge in terms of the pandemic. Governments that for years and years and years, including the Latvian government, said, no, we can't, we have to be conservative, we have to be, we have to be prudent about our finances. We cannot borrow money. No, we can't afford these social and economic rights. Well, that orthodoxy has been thrown out the window as every government in the world has taken to borrowing huge amounts of money, uh, which shows that it's a political choice. Uh, you want to have social and economic rights? Put your money where your mouth is, uh, and it's possible. So that's, that's a, a very interesting development to come out of the pandemic. Um, regarding uh, the Ukrainian crisis, I think it has, showed, it has shown everybody um, you know, that you, have to, that you cannot take democracy and peace for granted, um, that you have to fight for them. Um, and people had forgotten this. They had gotten complacent. They had gotten naive. They had gotten uh, very wishful. Th and, and that the international order, the international liberal order, needs defenders. It won't just survive unless people actively defend it. And when I see, uh, when I was yesterday at the reception center for Ukrainian refugees, I was so proud to see people who had not done anything regarding refugees before in their life step up uh, and organize and, and do things. It was great. Um, people in solidarity. I wish that solidarity could be spread. Uh, so it's not just for our neighbors from Ukraine, but it was a, a wider based solidarity. Uh, it shows what is possible in terms of people opening their hearts and, and helping people in need. Um, you know, so I think that these are these are very positive uh, signals that we also see, uh, and they show the possibilities for human rights. So it's a, these are the best of times, and these are the worst of times. Uh, I, yeah, from, from one perspective, because the cultural and historical ties of, of Latvian people with Ukrainian people, I think this conflict, for better or for worse, can spread empathy towards other conflicts as well. I hope so. I mean, everywhere, though, I mean, you have some... Some, char some people charging kind of East Europeans of racism, oh, but the double standards are towards dark people and so on. There probably is some racism uh, in there, but one, everywhere in the world, people have a different stance towards their neighbors than from people further away. And second, it's, a, it's, a political, it's an issue of political solidarity as well. I think Latvians identify with Ukrainians. Uh, we, have this, we have a similar history in the Soviet Union and we think, I remember when the Stinger, when Latvia sent Stinger uh, anti-aircraft missiles there, I thought, well, what's a th that's, a, that's an interesting thing to do. It's, it's a bit risky, kind of uh, shining the light on yourself. On the other hand, I think the, the, the calculus was probably, um, if the Ukrainians use these well, then we won't have to. Uh, <laughs> you know, so there's a, there's a political and a strategic solidarity there, uh, I think that explains it as well. But I think it does, it does show uh, kind of the reception. That is, I mean, 
it's amazing. The Temporary Protection Directive, which the EU just activated for the first time, it's existed for 20 years, never been activated, not, not in the Syrian refugee crisis, not another crisis. And, it's, and it should have been activated several times until now. But finally, uh, this kind of open door where we realize these people need protection. Uh, and they don't need protection for like six months. They need it for an extended period of time. And they need housing, and they need education, and they need support. Um, and it shows what is possible. I would like to say a huge thank you that you came. Except if you have a question maybe towards us or anything, but I wanted to say a big thank you that you came and we had a great discussion I, today. Indeed, I think uh, very topical, relevant, measurable. Needed. And needed, yes, and in that sense also multidisciplinary, as are your interests. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, no, I, I, I love engaging with students um, especially and happy to share share my experiences and 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 my thoughts uh, uh, whenever people find them interesting uh, <laughs> <They did. laughs> no, so thank you and and uh, I hope that uh, I hope that the issue of human rights and and engaging with human rights um, is on your daily agenda as law students, because I think that uh, we need we need we need people not not just smart corporate lawyers, but we need uh, people who who care about human rights as well. And in Latvia, my experience is many people are interested in the rights of states. Valstiasibs. What would that be in English? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like I said. I'm not so interested in the rights of states. I'm interested in the rights of people. <laughs> For sure. And and uh, and, um, and I think that this is a it's such an interesting time to be to be in human rights as well, and, and we need more we need more human rights warriors. So thanks for your interest. <laughs> Thank you.